Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone joining us today. We are live here in Madison, Wisconsin at DNA Star headquarters for today's webinar on the speed, accuracy, and capacity of our software applications supporting genomic and transcriptomic workflows. Um, my name is, is Tom Lynch. I am Vice President of Sales here at DNA Star, and I am joined here with my colleague, Matt Kaiser, who is our Senior Manager for our genomics applications. Uh, before we get into Matt's presentation of the applications, I'd like to take a couple of minutes and provide an overview of DNA Star and our full suite of software applications that enhance and support life science research. So here at DNA Star, you know, we are certainly most interested in offering an integrated solution for sequence and structural analysis that covers a broad spectrum of biochemical research and to certainly support all workflows and data types. So in our laser gene suite of software applications, um, showing here what researchers are able to do are to, to take um, their research from nucleic acid to gene sequence to multiple sequence alignment to variant detection to protein sequence and even structure. Our applications are connected to one another and this provides a seamless access to data and allows for efficient analysis to resolve complex issues uh, that come up during research and development. DNA star um, applications um, can also be accessed through multiple licensing options on desktop computers, through networks, and even Amazon Web Services via, via the DNA star cloud. Through our cloud offering, we're able to support large-scale data storage, genomic assemblies, and protein structure predictions so that local resources aren't tied up during long periods of data processing. So our first group of applications that we're going to focus on can be found in our molecular biology suite. And in this suite, researchers can access tools for cloning, primer design, Sanger assembly and analysis, multiple sequence alignments, and batch annotations. In our second group, genomic suite, researchers have the ability to access tools for next-gen sequence assemblies, analysis tools for numerous workflows, including RNA-seq, chip-seq, and exome sequencing, and also variant detection and ontology. And in our third and final group of applications, we offer tools for proteomics, including tools for the ability to, to analyze protein sequence um, and even do structure prediction. Um, in the fall, we will be offering tools for protein docking and support for specific antibody-focused workflows as well. So we're going to transition to Matt's portion of today's webinar. He'll be discussing some of our recent advances in our genomics applications and highlighting workflows identified by our audience as being most interesting. Matt will also feature how our applications are top in the areas of speed, accuracy and capacity. So Matt, perhaps you could give us a brief background on our genomics suite and then go into detail regarding our audience's chosen workflows. Yes, thank you, Tom. Um, I'd like to start today, again, uh, thank you for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon or this evening, wherever you may be. Um, and I'd like to start with a few slides to provide some background on, on our software for NGS analysis. So we'll go through a few slides and at that point, we'll launch into the software and I'll give you a demo of setting up sequence assemblies and then some of the uh, different downstream analysis options. And again, I encourage you to chat some questions in. Um, I'll be covering a lot of material here in just a relatively short time, so I'm sure there'll be some questions and, and please don't hesitate. So we'll be focusing uh, the webinar on the Laser Gene Genomics Suite, which is a cluster of programs that handles NGS data for assembly, um, and it's an easy project setup followed by multiple different analysis tools. The genomics suite is very flexible, so it can handle all different types of projects and all different types of sequencing technology. So really the goal for us is to provide a single solution for those uh, departments or labs that have multiple different data sources and are doing uh, multiple different types of NGS workflows. Uh, in, uh, by comparison, if you were to use open source software, you'd oftentimes need a specific software to handle a workflow and a particular type of data. 
and it becomes uh, quite uh, difficult to manage multiple different programs. So we try to pull that together in a very uh, unified manner so that we can work with different data types as well as different workflows, things like uh, de novo transcriptome, RNA-seq, uh, targeted resequencing, and genomic analysis. So one of the questions that will come up is, you know, how can you, how can you run um, extremely large data sets on desktop computers? So there's a, a misconception that you have to have, you know, a large Linux cluster or you have to have access to a core facility to, uh, to just to handle all the data. And at DNA Star, we really strive to developing software that runs on modest desktop computers, or in some cases, laptop computers. And what I have in the slide here is just a kind of a preferred setup. Um, the core computer um, may have 16 gigs of RAM or 32 gigs of RAM, maybe a desktop or, or a, a laptop computer. And we like to have essentially three disks, another disk to handle um, what we call it's a scratch disk that handles temporary files. And oftentimes we just plug in an external drive, a cheap external drive through USB 3. And depending on how much data you have, you may want another disk for storage. And so if you're going to be trying to demo out, um, if you have very small data sets, microbial data sets, you might just use your, your laptop computer. But if you want to try larger data sets, alignments to human genomes or eukaryotic genomes, you want to make sure that you have at least a scratch disk set up to handle the temporary files, and that's something we can help you with um, if you have if you have questions there. Uh, another option, if you if you don't have hardware available to you, or you only get your hardware updated every every few years, is to utilize the hardware that's up on the Amazon cloud. And we've designed our software so that it's very easy to send the assembly job, set the assembly up locally, but then send the job up encrypted into a storage space on the Amazon cloud and let Amazon, uh, their hardware, run, run the assemblies. Um, there's some other advantages in that you can share the data. So if you have uh, collaborators at different locations, they can log into the same location to access the data. And another advantage is that you can run multiple concurrent assemblies. So if you have to run 50 exomes uh, overnight, you can utilize the cloud and, and it'll, it'll run 50 virtual instances of, of a piece of hardware and get the job done very quickly. So there's some distinct advantages to cloud software. So one of the first focal points is the accuracy. Um, this is something we've worked hard on for the last, uh, last two to three years now. And it's really, uh, we've really strive to make sure that our software is not only fast and runs on modest computers, but is also the most accurate software available. And so we utilize some data sets uh, at the Genome in a Bottle Consortium, which is a control genome that is the most validated in sequence control genome. It's called NA12878. And this is publicly available. And we can use their data to calibrate our software. So we can run our assembler, um, run our SNP caller, apply the appropriate filters. And then that end result, you take that and compare it to the reference standard to see how accurate are we in, in calling the SNPs? And, and we're at a very good place. We're well above 99%, close to 100%. Uh, the answer itself isn't quite 100%, so I don't think you can ever exactly get there, but we're getting as close, close as we can. And we have, uh, again, this is just kind of hitting the high points, but our, our website has white papers and, and instructions on how to get to the different data if you want to run this yourself. And it's built into the software. So the number that you're looking at in this table, which is uh, performance metrics on three different exomes, it's all available um, through our website. So you can run the same data through our software, come up with the same results, or uh, acquire your own data with a reference standard and do your own verification. So this is just a, a performance on three different exomes, three different captures of the, uh, the control genome, NA12878, and from three different sources, and TP stands for total positives. You can see that the Mount Sinai is more than twice the size of the other two exomes. And you can see that the sensitivity, if we go over here to, to the uh, sixth column, we're at 99.6 or higher on all three. So we're consistent uh, across data sets that are captured differently and prepared differently. Um, and the time at the far right is about two hours per exome. So we're getting assembly plus all the SNP calling done in a very short amount of time and very accurate. 
Um, some of the accuracy, if you, if you dig into the numbers, things like false negatives were very low with the false negatives. And we have some comparisons then of our software then to um, commercial competitors, also uh, some of the open source competitors. And those are in detail on, uh, on our support page. I'll just show you one quick one, which is a comparison to uh, CLC Bio, Kyogen. And when we look at the exome, table three, we can see, um, again, sensitivity, we're a full percentage point better. Um, and, and really where a big difference will come in is the false negatives. We're much, much lower on false negatives, which are very concerning, and false positives. So we think we have the, the fastest and most accurate um, assembler and SNP caller that's available to researchers. So we're, we think we're in a great place there. And these same algorithms get used then for all different workflows. So we reuse them in, in some of the other workflows. Another uh, uh, piece of, of data that we'll look at, not, not in too much detail, but we have some new capability uh, from earlier this year, and that's the increase and in expanded ability to bring in annotations from outside sources. And so as we're doing the analysis, um, we can bring, connect with databases, populate gene tables and SNP tables. Uh, this particular one is the Human Variant Annotation Database. And it's actually a collection of databases that we've curated. So it includes things like SIFT and Polyfen and Mutation Tester and conservation and evol uh, evolutionary uh, conservation scores, ClinVar. And we combine that with genotype frequency and allele frequencies from 1,000 genomes in the exome variant server and dbSNP. And so we bundle those together and make it automated to pull that information into the analysis. So, and I'll show you what the kind of the end result is in one of the one of the projects that I have. So at this point, I'd like to pause. Um, I don't know if any questions came in, um, but I can certainly answer any questions that came up right now, and then we'll go into the software demo. Yeah, I do have one, Matt. Um, so researcher is asking, um, what if they have their own uh, SNP database for variant analysis and filtering, and how does that kind of uh, connect with our software? Uh, yes, yeah, so our, our software has uh, both automated connection to databases, and there's also a what we call a, an import wizard. So as long as the database um, has a unique gene identifier and that that identifier matches what's in the project, um, they can be mapped into the project. So no problem there. There's a lot of flexibility uh, for importing those databases. Okay. All right, so we'll jump out of the PowerPoint here and start with the assembly software. So the assembly software is a Seekman engine, and it's, it's really a wizard that is going to guide us through different assembly types. And, and it's been redesigned recently. It has a more streamlined look and feel now. Um, so, and, and really the goal here is to make this as easy as can be, and, and so that if you've never set up an assembly before, uh, that you can open Seekman Engine and navigate through and set up your projects. And, and, and it, we think we've had really nice success with that, and I'll show you how that uh, works. So there's assemble on a local computer. If I want to assemble on the cloud, I can click this icon, and it will set the project up here but send the job up to Amazon. And we have some capability to rerun assemblies. But we'll just start with assembling locally. And it breaks the next, and as we proceed through this wizard, there's a next button down here, and you can see a history of pages that we're, we're going through in the wizard building on the left. And as we start to choose the assembly workflow, underneath the hood, there's different algorithms that are going to be used for some of these different um, workflows. In some cases, they're shared. In the case of whole genome and exome and gene panel, whole genome, yes? Uh, Matt, we have a question coming sure. in about the algorithms um, used. So are these algorithms that are publicly available, or are these algorithms that were developed here at DNA Star? So, the, so these are our DNA Star algorithms. Um, our, our SeekMan uh, software has been around for you know, more than 20 years, so, so we, we actually predate most of the open source algorithms. Um, we use our own algorithm uh, for NGS data, and, and that's what gives us the speed. It's a patented algorithm that allows us to handle vast amounts of data on relatively limited hardware. So, so we choose to use our own because we think our own algorithms are faster and more accurate than what's, than what's uh, in the open source world. So as I pick um, 
workflow, you'll see when I pick genome, I have multiple different types of genome assemblies. I have a template assembly normal. That's going to use our high capacity assembler and use our SNP caller and build out band.assembly files. We also have a de novo option. It uses a different set of algorithms. And then we have some specialized algorithms um, that are particular to uh, um, genome assembly. If I choose exome and gene panel, these are targeted captures, so it's going to be an alignment of, of data to a reference genome or a reference set of genes. You can see now the assembly type is more limited, right? I'm going to align templated, and I also have this other option to go through a variant called um, accuracy test. So if I want to kind of reproduce some of the data that's in our white papers on accuracy calculations, I can, it's a whole workflow that we built in to make it easy to use and accessible to customers. So as we make these decisions then, whether it's genome or exome, uh, there's different branches. So we'll, we'll stick with genome and go with a template and assembly and we retrieve some system information from your computer to see how much RAM you have. This is a big computer that we're on today that I use for human genome uh, uh, size alignments and temporary file location. So it gives us a little bit of hardware info. And in this case, I'm going to pick a multiple sample project. This is going to be a, uh, a salmonella, a set of salmonella genome strains that we want to compare to each other. I believe it's 18 strains. And what I did is I selected a GenBank file. If I remove this, you see there's several options here. I can add a single file, add a folder. I can download genome packages. And these packages are, are uh, allow us to connect to the DNA Star website. And we make these packages available to our customers. Uh, they're different model organisms. And they're just a bundle of the, the annotated GenBank files. Um, plus the DB SNP database files are, are bundled together so that you get all the known variations plus all the feature annotations and the sequence data for that organism. For bacteria, we typically don't have genome template packages. There's too many strains. Um, uh, there are a few and, and we can build them, but generally with bacteria, what we do is just add the, the GenBank file. And we always want to pick GenBank files because they're annotated. And in this case, I'm going to also add a VCF file. VCF stands for Variant Call Format. This is just a set of sequences. Now, we can take a peek inside here. If I can find my folder, it's over here. So here's the salmonella strains, VCF. We'll just take a peek inside. And what you see inside the VCF file is some header information. And we get chromosome and position, and then the, the allele uh, designation. And all, that, all this is is just a list of SNPs that I, I think are interesting. Maybe from some previous analysis, I created this VCF file. And I want to compare 18 strains to see if they have these SNPs or not. There's several thousand SNPs here. So I can load that into the software. Same thing with a, uh, a targeted resequencing or an exome. Um, we'll load a VCF file um, to say, here's, our, here's some SNPs of interest. Let's make a record of them. Um, I added data. So these are FASTQ files. Um, they're paired files. You can see they have the same name with a one or a two designation. And this is uh, 36 files. So we're loading a whole bunch of data at one time. And when that drops into our interface, we can say, this is multiple sample. Um, or I could have all those FASTQ files for one sample. It would be a lot of data for one bacterial genome. Um, and it will recognize, I can click the auto name, and it will recognize that these two go together by the experiment name, just the way that these are named. Or I could go in and rename this manually, and I can select multiple files. You know, if those files belong to a sample, I can group them and name them. So there's multiple ways to set up assemblies so that you can handle multiple projects at one time, which is a really nice capability. So I've loaded 18 different projects in. Um, if I have a control, I can specify it here. Um, and then it's just some really simple uh, assembly metrics. I've got minimum match percentage, which is the percent the read must match the template in order to align. And that's really the most impactful parameter. If you want to make it more stringent, increase it. Less stringent, decrease it. I don't touch anything else generally with templated assemblies. That's the, the, the main uh, uh, parameter that has the most impact. 
Variant detection mode, this is the type of SNP caller, statistical SNP caller that's going to be applied. These are bacteria, so we're going to have a haploid SNP caller that runs through, through the data. And then there's some default filtering that we keep on low. And the default filtering is to try to reduce the amount of sequencing noise uh, that comes into the SNP uh, report. If you turn off all the filtering, uh, then every sequencing error in the NGS data will show up as a potential variation, which 99% which, uh, of that will be false positive noise. So we have some very reasonable filters. Again, they're calibrated to our, our white paper work. Right? We know where to put these filters of Illumina data based on the answer we have with the human genome alignment. So we gain, even though this is a bacterial uh, project, we still gain from everything that we learned with the Genome in a Bottle Consortium and the ability to fine-tune these SNP callers. So now I can name the project and pick an output folder. And we can see here the output are going to be dot, for each sample there's a dot assembly, which is a BAM file with a collection of accessory files. And when we click Next, uh, what we have is a script of instructions for the assembly. Now you can see that on the left we've built up this kind of a pathway. So we can go back to any point in the wizard to see where we've been. And the script then tells the assembler what to do. And sometimes we can save that script and send it to tech support if we have questions. And when we click start, we get a log. And so this is watching the assembler progress then. And if there's any problems here, we can export the log again, send it to tech support, and we can just watch the progression of the assembler go. And what, part of what makes it so fast is if I open a task manager, um, let's see, where's my CPU? I'll just sort here. So here it's XNG. You can see it'll use bursts of, of there's some memory. Right now it's using 92% of my CPU. So it's going to use all the cores in my CPU and get a whole lot of work done very quickly. I'm not going to let this run while our webinar is going, though. It, it, it is a little bit greedy at the front. When it's done, there will be a button that says Launch in Array Star. If I want to look at all the samples together and compare them, or I can look at individual samples and, and, and open them individually. So when that's done, we'll have a button that does this next step. I'm just going to quit this so we're not interfering with our webinar. And I'm just going to open Array Star. So Array Star then is a it's a multiple project analyzing software, and it can take in all types of data. In this case, it, it automatically connects with the assembly software and it populates Array Star with an experiment list. And there's our 18 different strains of Salmonella. And I can click on each one of them, and we get some on the far right. We get a details panel that gives us some information about what type of an assembly it was and some of the parameters um, that were involved. Uh, but really what I'm interested in is I want to look at the SNP table. So for this type of a project, it's pretty straightforward. I want to know what variants are in common or unique to all of these different samples. And so I can go to a SNP table, and the SNP table now becomes a summary table of um, these salmonella strains. And I can filter it all different ways. And we have whole webinars that spend half the time, you know, filtering tables like this. Um, but what I'm looking at is the ref ID column. That's the, 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 the source sequence. So that's the um, Heidelberg strain of Salmonella. And we get the position in the reference sequence, the gene name. The user ID comes out of that VCF file. This is just the numerical, the, the ID number of the SNPs of interest that were in, in my file. And then I get each sample and what the called seat was. Right, so I can see if I scroll here, there's all 18 samples. And there's a color scheme as well. And if there are variations, we have, uh, if we have non-synonymous changes, they're colored in red. If we have synonymous changes, they're colored in uh, light blue. And if there's no change observed at all, we get this kind of very, very hard to see on my projector, but it's, it's a, a light gray C. And if we hover over these cells, you can see that we get a summary then of that SNP. So here for this particular sample, uh, there is no change. And so we recorded that information. And the reason for that is it was in a VCF file. 
and, I, and that told the assembler, I want for all my samples, I want information recorded for every sample. I don't want empty cells here where I can't interpret that. I, it might be that it is, uh, that there's no coverage there or I missed sequencing that sample. So we get this nice summary now of what happened at that location. The depth is 197, there's no change. Here's one in sample 570 where we have a, a non-synonymous change, right? So they pop out really nice and I can see, oh, there's a non-synonymous, here's a synonymous change in the other sample. Um, again, I can filter this table. So when I look at the bottom left, there is a total of 135,921 SNPs in the erase our database here, but I filtered it so that we're really looking at 3,047. The filtering dialogs, and again, this will be the same no matter what the data sets are. So if it's human genome, exome, targeted resequencing, it's the same kind of looks and feels the same. So I can filter at the SNP level and the gene level, and I can create sets to compare, or I can just apply a filter across all. So I can look for SNPs that occur in any one of these 18 experiments. And when I go to the criteria, uh, because this is a relatively simple experiment, I just have some SNP statistics, um, I can apply a whole uh, different set of SNPs. I can say, you know, show me only certain types of non-synonymous SNPs. So I can define the type of, type of SNP that I'm looking at. Show me the statistics. So I can filter on depth, percent, PNET ref, Q call, whether it's in the custom SNP database or not, or in DB SNP. So as I apply the SNPs and say OK and search, I get a number down here. So there's 610 SNPs. And as I do that, I can save those results. and have a collection of sets in ArrayStar. You can see I've done this in this project a few different times. And if I want to look at any particular set, I can go and look and say, well, let's look at just that set. Or I could say, show me the gene. I'm not really interested in the SNP, the individual SNPs, but I'm more interested in what genes they occur. Are they disrupting a subset of genes? So I can say, show me that result in the SNP table or even just in the gene table. Um, now you can see with the genes, I don't have other columns. So I can say, well, let's, we can add more information if it's there. And here we don't have annotation information pulled in. So there's different ways to pull in annotations. Um, one way, if I want to have some annotations, is to go to a database and download annotations. And I don't believe we have one for Salmonella, but I could try to pull in an E. coli database. Sometimes we'll be, you'll get a lot, enough annotations there. So this is one of the auto connections to a database within ArrayStar for multiple different organisms. And it'll give me a, a, a feedback to say, well, you only, only had 100 annotations that came in, or maybe I'll have several thousand. This is small enough, it can check pretty quickly. So I get 535, so I might say that that is, that is good enough. And now I have some Go annotations. We'll see if we got any here. I'd, and then we get a little bit of annotation. If I sort by annotation, we can see we just pulled in and to answer the question earlier, if you had your Salmonella specific database, I can go to File, Import Annotations, and I don't have one ready to load, but we can pull in all different types of annotation files. Typically a tab separated text file is the best way to go. And again, as long as that uh, database file has this gene name, uses these gene names, I'll be able to pull in any type of annotation and retain the, the column headers. So that's kind of the, the, the basic functionality for multiple sequence analysis, um, multiple sample analysis. So let's go back and, and take a look at another, another sample here. So I've got, um, see, let's go to the tumor. So we're going to go to a, a paired sample. And I'm just going to launch another Seekman engine. And just show you, now if we pick a, a, a targeted resequencing, it's going to be templated. Um, I can input template files, so I could download a genome template package. We're not going to wait for loading that whole package in. I'm just going to, I'm just going to fool the, I'm just going to load a, a folder that has some files in it. Now you see that we can have a VCF file and a bed file. 
and a bed file is for targeted resequencing, it is uh, specifying the regions that have been targeted. So if it's an exome, it's going to be, you know, a couple hundred thousand exons a lot of times. So it's a pretty big file. But you'll always have, what's key is to have a bed file that matches your, your, your data set. Okay, and I, I'll just move through here just to show you that it's a very similar project setup. I can load in data again. So I had this preloaded last time. So if I have, we'll just pretend this is our tumor control. So I can select a couple groups. So this is just a different way to show you how this can be loaded. So there's a cancer. Now, while we're going through this, uh, sure. we have a question come in. It's kind of going back to the dot assembly files that are created and kind of the attributes. Um, the audience member is asking, what if they have their own BAM files? Um, so, so BAM, so BAM files um, can be two varieties. One can be a pre-aligned BAM file that can as output from some other aligner, and sometimes BAM files are. Um, used as raw sequence data. So ion torrent in particular uses BAM files to hold their sequence data. Those we can treat just like FASTQ files and align them. Just we extract the sequence information out of them and realign. If you have a BAM file from another liner, we generally would recommend go back and get the raw data. You're going to get a better assembly with our software. Use the FASTQ files as a starting point. Okay. Thank you. So for the cancer workflow, we're going to pick a somatic um, cancer SNP caller, click Next. So you can see the workflow is very similar. And it's ready to go. And so we would click Assemble, launch an array star, um, and it'll look something like this, only two experiments now, normal and tumor. And if we go to a SNP table, a common thing to do is to create two sets then and create a set of the normal, create a set of the cancer, maybe just not, maybe just uh, basic filters. So I might just do a, you know, filter all. What I can do is say, let's make a set of normal. It's very simplistic. And just all the non-synonymous, maybe put a, a depth limit, 25, and we can do things like SNP percent, so some basic kind of filters. All right, and then when I search, I'll get, oh, let's see. Oh, I'm in gene mode right here. I've already done that search, so let's go here to the set list. So I can have sets for normal and tumor, and once I've created sets, I can do things like Venn diagrams. And this is just a kind of a subtraction. A, B, most of the SNPs are in common. Most of the SNPs in the cancer sample are, are Mendelian in, in nature. Uh, this sliver over here, the B sliver, is larger than the A sliver. And so there are some SNPs in here. These are the ones I'm going to be interested in that are in the tumor sample but not in the normal sample. And you'll notice there are some SNPs in the normal sample that aren't in the tumor. We can investigate those and explain what they are. Why are there some SNPs here? Um, and what's really nice about using this, this workflow is I can go now and focus and say, show me that table of selected SNPs. And so this table then is, here's all the SNPs that are, here's all the SNPs that are only in the tumor sample, right? And I have all this information that was imported in. So now I have a mutation taster, LRT. What happened is that variant annotation database can automatically, when, I, when this project was first imported, it's automatically hooking up and feeding database information into the SNP table. So now as uh, compared to the Salmonella project, when I go to add manage columns, I get all these additional categories. And this is from the auto import of 
of the human annotation database information. And, and you know, again, we can spend, can spend a lot of time, and I, as I click through, you see allele frequencies, genotype, functional predictions. And I can populate by selecting any of these and adding these columns, and I can populate this whole table then and move things around. It's a really nice uh, table manager, so I can move things within the table, right, to populate this table in a, in a certain, however I want it. So with this information then I get uh, gene names, cosmic cancer IDs, the called seek, and I get this information on mutation taster and polyphen. And if I hover over a cell, I get all the information about that particular SNP. Now here's what's oftentimes what you, you need to do to verify. I may need to go and look at a position to see why is it in the normal and not in the tumor, or why is it in the tumor but not detectable in the normal. I can then send the selection I can send the selection then to uh, Seekman Pro, and now it's saying, oh, I can't find it, so I'll have to, um, let's see if I have it right up here. Oh, did that not all transfer over? Oh, my file didn't transfer over all the way. I'll just demonstrate here. Snip table. So there's some more connectivity here. So if I, when I'm working in the SNP table, I can right click on any row in a SNP table and send it to Seekman Pro. And it's saying, which experiment do I want to look at? If I want to look at 556, five, I can select it. And so when you're doing things like comparing different strains, or looking at cancer and normal together, uh, it's very, very handy to be able to do that. So what it did is it opened up another program that looks at the BAM files. It looks at the aligned reads. And so what I have here are the aligned reads, and there's the SNP variation. It focuses right on that spot, and I can see the SNPs. And so that's very, very important type of analyses to validate the whole process, because you're going to have questions on position. So if I want to know why, you know, there's a SNP in 556, five, but it wasn't called in this other sample. And when we're doing cancer normal, you, you find yourself doing this all the time. You know, why, you know, why was a SNP in the normal, for instance? That was surprising. So I can go and look at these two samples just like that. Two different assemblies, and I can quickly navigate and look at, if I expand these windows just right, I can look at both positions and see why a SNP call was made in one and not the other. So it's a really, really powerful analysis, and it's used for all. This is the Salmonella, the cancer normal. We use it throughout the software. So I know that's a lot of information thrown at you very quickly. Um, I'm going to show you one other type of a project. And if we go to Seekman Engine again, I'll just back up. If I take a transcriptomics project, You'll see that transcriptomics templated or de novo, two very different algorithms. Um, when I choose the templated, it's the same algorithm as what we use for our genome and our targeted resequencing. I can still load a VCF file, I can load a template file, load sequence data, um, still do a SNP caller. The only difference now is we're going to have a, 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 a gene quantitation, a normalization. So we're going to go through and use an RPKM algorithm to come up with a gene expression value for um, based on the number of aligned reads to, to genes in the project. And we're still getting SNP calling, so I'll get both types of calls, right? So the interface almost the same. You know, we can set up multiple projects. Make wiggle files, that's one different thing with the, with the transcriptomics, right, and it's ready to assemble. And when it's done, I can do the same thing. I can bring it into a Raystar. And in this case, I had set up, a, a, it was a, some mouse RNA-seq, pre-tumor, tumor control, 
And a real simple way to use array star for gene expression is to launch things like a scatter plot. So this is a comparison of, of tumor and pretumor. And I might just say, well, I'm only interested in a few of the genes that are up expressed. And I can just select them right in the scatter plot and focus just on that, that pattern. Or I can apply different filters just like we did for SNPs. Say, only show me the genes upregulated by certain fold changes and p-values. All, all those filters are available. There's quick filters on the right. And now what I can do is just say, show a table of, of, of those genes. And there I have a table, and I'll just show you what's in the columns as we wrap things up here. I have uh, the name of the gene, the source sequence. Here's the signal then that's in the pre-tumor, tumor, and control. And I can see these are in log two, so we get this greatly upregulated signal in this first gene. And again, I brought in annotation information. So this went through the same, this is mouse data. So I did a data, download, annotations, and I picked the mouse and downloaded that into the project. And you could bring in your own annotations as well. So same kind of a workflow. Um, and that allows me to do differential gene expression analysis. And again, if I want to go and look at the assembled data at that point, I can right click, send to Seekman Pro, um, and I can pick my project and it will load that into Seekman Pro and allow us to visualize uh, those sequences just like we did before. So that is, uh, if there's any questions, I, I went through an awful lot there very quickly, um, but I'll take any questions at this point. Well, thank you very much, Matt. Yes, we do have a, a question that came in. Perhaps we could go back to the uh, filter um, criteria window um, and maybe kind of give a little bit more kind of in-depth view of, of all the different options in this window that would be uh, appreciated by one of the audience members. Okay, I'll go into the one that's the most complex here just to show you. I, yeah, I did, I did uh, skip over that. Um, let's go into the, so that the, that the cancer, human cancer data set has many more columns of information here, right? So if I go, when I go to the filter at the SNP level, I can filter at multiple different criteria. I can filter uh, based on the SNP sample group. So that's essentially making a set from whatever experimental groups are in the project. But I can also search on annotations, ontology, statistics. There's different, and as I pick these different criteria, I get different fields here to filter on. This is a text search of annotations. Um, I most commonly use the SNP SNP sample group to create sets to get Venn diagrams. That's the way that I prefer to use the software. Um, but when I go, in this particular case, I'm saying find SNPs in one of two experiments. So I want to make a set for the normal group. And when I go to the SNP criteria, this is where I get all the filtering options. Right? So this dialog has expanded greatly in the last couple of years. And you can see there's different tabs. I get the general tab, and this allows me to search by type, whether it's a SNP or an indel, on genotype, on the, you know, the class of SNP, if it's an intergenic or genic region, coding, non-coding, non-synonymous, synonymous. So all different kind of typical SNP filters, whether it's in a targeted region or not. If we're doing a, if we're doing a targeted resequencing, an exome or a, bed fo uh, or a, a gene panel, this is one of the most important filters. So we're going to ignore everything that falls outside our intended regions of, of targeting. And that's applied by default when it is a, a uh, targeted resequencing sample. Um, so I can make selections here. Then we go to statistics, so it's things like filters on depth. And so typically you want to have a depth filter, um, SNP percent. If this project had uh, was a haploid or a diploid SNP caller, we would have p-values on, on the SNP call based off the expectation of whether or not it's heterozygous or homozygous. Uh, custom SNP databases, uh, that's again a DCF file. We can filter against that DCF file or the DB SNP database. And here's where, so these first two tabs are um, available to most projects, so non-human projects, bacterial projects. Um, you get these first two tabs. When you import human data from the variant annotation database, you get these four additional tabs 
they're all filterable. So here's population genetics. Um, I can go in, you know, this is, and pick a specific subgroup, Central European Utah, right? And I can say, only show me SNPs that are rare in the general subpopulation. So it's a great filter if you're looking for possible disease-causing variations. I can say, only show me the rare ones. I don't want to look at all the commonly occurring SNPs. And of course, SNPs vary a lot between populations. So what's common in one might be rare in another ethnic, ethnic group. So those are genetics, functional prediction, um, LRT. When you click on one, you get this description in the middle um, of what it is. And you can apply filters. Once you're familiar with how these show up, I can apply filters on polyphen and SIFT and LRT. So I can say, only show me those that are known to be. So I'm adding these database filters now, group scores. You know, it's common to have, you know, evolutionary rate profile of certain sizes and pathogenicity. So ClinVar significance. So is it pathogen pathogenic? What I don't recommend though is doing what I just did and that's apply a whole bunch of filters without looking at the end result. Oftentimes you'll filter everything away if you apply too many at one time. <laughs> so um, what I like to do is start kind of what I had here. I'm just going to cancel here. With minimal filters, see what you have Sort some columns to get a feel for how these um, how these show up. You know, how does polyphen uh, polyphen predictions? And I can sort by these columns and I'll sort again. You know, how many probably damaging SNPs do I actually have in my sample, and how many uh, SIF predictions are damaging? And then apply a couple of filters and um, see what the results look like. Excellent, excellent. Well, before we uh, pass it back to Katie. Uh, Matt, maybe you could give a quick uh, preview of of what's to come in the fall release and what your team has been working on so very hard. And um, I, I can, yeah. Uh, so, so I, I'm also involved with some of the uh, uh, product development, and with these workflows, it's nice to have more of a, a, a browser type capability. So we have a, a new program that's on the way called GenVision Pro. And GenVision Pro will allow us to load in um, whole genomes, multiple, you know, 20, 30 genomes, and compare all the data tracks side by side. And it'll be interactive with ArraySTAR. So I can go in and load uh, this dot assembly, the output from our assembly. So this is a mouse genome. It's very responsive. So I can load in a couple, you know, tumor, pre-tumor and pick a chromosome. And so again, this is development software, so we don't have all the features in yet, but it's just loaded two very large projects, and now it's loading in the mouse chromosome. And this becomes a browser where I can zoom in, I can move back and forth, I can see features here. And then we have a lower pane here that zooms in on particular features, and we get coverage plots. So if there's, if I picked one the head coverage, we'd have a coverage plot there. There's some deep coverage. And we can have multiple tracks then, pre-tumor, tumor, have multiple tracks of data, control how they look. So I can, I can go to a track menu over here. So it's going to be a really nice uh, browser that integrates with our software. I just want to show you how that integration will work. So a typical use case would be you know, we're in RNA-seq and we've got, uh, you know, multiple samples that we want to compare. So if we find, you know, I might want to look at uh, the tumor in this particular gene, I'll be able to right-click and send these samples, all three of them, to the browser. And it'll go right to that position and show us the coverage plots then, you know, for those three samples at that position and allow us to navigate and scroll and, and search and locate different positions. So, yeah, we're very excited about this new piece of software. It's looking for uh, later this year in the fall. Uh, it'll be part of our uh, genomics package. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, Matt, very much for uh, taking the time, and thank you to our audience for uh, making the time to join us today. We hope that we found this to be very helpful um, for your genomics-focused research. And Katie, I will uh, hand it back to you.